Welcome back to What Happens Next, the podcast that examines some of the biggest challenges facing our world and asks the experts, what will happen if we don't change? And what can we do to create a better future? I'm Dr. Susan Carland. Keep listening to find out what happens next. We think of play as being sort of a, you know, casual, almost throwaway activity, but it's actually very attention directed and very attention honing. You don't have to be perfect. In fact, that's that's not even the point. The point is to to play with something, to play with something that you love, and and to explore. So it's not just about good psychological hygiene. You know, it also has a host of physiological benefits as well. I'm your host, Dr. Susan Carland, and I'm no fun. Chances are, if you're also an adult, you're not much fun either. It's not our fault. Unfortunately for us, somewhere along the way, we've forgotten how to play. Last week on the show, our guests outlined the negative consequences of neglecting play, from decreased creativity to higher rates of burnout. Today, we're here to prove that play isn't just reserved for kids with boundless energies. We're talking about why it's vital for adults too. And if you, like me, are wondering how on earth you'll fit a play date into your diary, there's good news. We have expert advice on how to introduce a little silliness into your day between all those grown-up responsibilities. Early childhood educators have known for a long time about the importance of play for developing minds. But did you know it can be used to train the next generation of scientists and engineers? Dr. Marilyn Fleer is a laureate professor in Monash University's Faculty of Education. She's at the helm of a major research project, the Conceptual Play Lab, a living lab that tests groundbreaking play-based models for teaching advanced concepts to young children. Marilyn, welcome to the podcast. Oh, thank you for inviting me in, Susan. Tell us a bit about the Conceptual Play Lab. What is it? Why did you create it? I guess it's a way to describe it is it's a um, uh, a living laboratory. Our play lab um, supports the learning and development of children in the area of STEM, so science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, but with a special focus on on girls because we know that um, governments and communities are worried about um, women and girls in STEM, and so we're very mindful of of that as part of what we do. And so what are you actually investigating in this living lab? Well, we have three pillars of research. Our our first pillar focuses on how uh, very young children think and develop um, their thinking over time. And our research question around that is actually, well, what is it that motivates them? Um, And what are the kind of concepts in STEM that are really um, uh, inspiring for them and help them explain the world? So that's our first pillar. Our second pillar um, does similarly, except we're focused on families. And what we're really interested in in the families is how um, how the family members support their children to have these rich STEM conversations. So, so in everyday life, what what might be the the force that they're experiencing when they're pushing their trikes through the sand and then they're cycling um, across some concrete. And so it's how to talk about everyday life uh, with a STEM focus and to to, to really inspire and um, uh, our next generation of scientists, engineers, technologists and mathematicians. Mm. Yeah, and the third pillar um, is about the teachers and the educators and supporting them to become confident and competent um, in their um, uh, teaching of STEM in early childhood settings. It's very interesting to hear this because I would have assumed that children are naturally curious and creative, so they wouldn't really need this, that they would their, their default uh, cognitive position is one of curiously and creatively engaging with the world around them. But it sounds like from what you're saying, they actually need dedicated guidance in this area. I think, I I think that what our research is showing us is that um, um, that children are curious and very capable. What families need, and in and also in educators in early childhood settings, is they need some way in which that they can 
really support their children to go that little bit further. And so rather than having rather than having educators or family members do sort of boring um, text-based things to teach them. Force teach equals them math times acceleration. Exactly, exactly. And and go out and buy all this expensive equipment and, and you know, think that by giving them this equipment that they're somehow teaching them concepts. Um, well, our research says that those families are saying, oh, we really love this because we we love it because we, we know we're learning how we can play with our children and not force feed them concepts. And and it kind of gives the, the families and the educators in the early childhood center, centres a way of, of really exploring and nurturing this natural curiosity that, you know, you were alluding to, Susan. And um, But to do it with a bit more structure um, in terms of the thinking that they might do. But it's all very play-based. Mm. So from the child's perspective, it's just having a great time. One truly astounding insight to emerge from the Play Lab was seeing just how early children engage in imaginative play. One of the sites um, has um, um, a team of teachers who are working with infants and toddlers. So we're talking about 12-month-olds to 18-month-old. And um, and in our interviews with um, in this particular case, this example, uh, they said things to us like, Oh, I never thought babies could learn about all these complicated words, uh, and because they'd been reading the story of March of the Ants, um, and in March of the Ants, of course, there's lots of ants everywhere, and um, as part of and a lovely rhythm to the story, and they said they said, well, we were using words like antenna, mandibles, um, uh, you know, all different part colony. Um, where the ants live, the chamber, the queen ant, the worker ant. We were using all these words with these young children and they said, you know, um, when some of these children 12 months later were in the next room and we picked up a book and it had an ant in it, um, they started making the actions of the um, of the ant in terms of how they actually use a scissor action to cut leaves as part of um, eating and um, and so this teacher said, well, I started to sing the song of the March of the Ants, and you know, the ants go marching one by one, hurrah, hurrah. And um, and this child, this you know, twelve months later, this child started marching, and um, and that and um, so the teacher said, this is just amazing. She said, you know, I. I knew this was powerful. It knew that I was doing the right thing by introducing all these words, but I didn't realise how meaningful it was that this child, 12 months later, and, you know, as a two-year-old and they were a one-year-old, actually had really embodied and understood aspects of what she was doing. And um, and the other really inspiring thing is that a lot of early childhood educators um, say, oh, babies and toddlers, they can't do imaginative play. Um, you know, they just explore objects, they mouth them and they manipulate them, but they don't do imaginary play. Well, because this model is all about imagining yourself in the ant world, in this example, on being an ant and exploring as an ant, even as, as young infants and toddlers, um, and, you know, taking food back to the colony to, to feed the babies, um, which was one of the problems that arose, uh, you know, as part of the investigation of the, the babies. And, um, and these teachers are saying things like, well, you know, we see every day um, these children, these babies, doing imaginary play because we've created this beautiful imaginary world and they can do this. So it's really, really powerful and we're so, so excited. <laughs> I bet. And I think what you've realised is uh, time to make things harder for the babies. Forget singing ant songs. I think let's teach them Avogadro's constant and let's get them right into difficult chemistry because I think they can manage it. <laughs> Well, it's really it's just exciting to to see to see how such a young mind can embrace it, create the right conditions. They embrace this, so the, it's not just the curiosity. And and yes, I agree that you know we we're, we're nurturing that as well. But if unless you create those conditions, you don't stretch and give them all the possibilities that could be available to them. The benefits of creative play follow children long after nursery school and throughout their development. Hello, my name is Margaret Barrett. My current role at Monash University is as head of the Sir Zelman Cohen School of Music and Performance. Uh, I'm a music educator, a musician, a music researcher, and I'm fascinated 
by the ways in which we engage with music from the very earliest moments of life through to the end. How has the music education influenced the creative process in areas such as writing or visual arts? Do you find that, uh, you know, being strong or being creative in music can uh, result in great, greater creativity in other areas? Do they talk to each other, I guess? If you Google, you know, why a music education, you'll get lots of um, results saying, you know, music improves cognition, mm. music improves memory, music uh, improves maths and English and language. And it's, as one of my colleagues once said, I'd love to see the study that um, demonstrated that maths improved music. Mm. There'd be a nice way to switch that yeah. around. Yeah. Um, but I think what, what happens in music engagement for young children where they are encouraged to experiment, they are actually working through a creative process. You know, experimental play is with a young child is playing with materials and ideas and then from that process perhaps moving to selecting their favourites mm. so and discarding others. And then from that process thinking about how they might put those materials and ideas together and create a sequence or a pattern. And, and in that way, they're involved in a creative process built from that experimentation and playfulness. Mm, and I really agree with you about what you're saying, that the creativity of music can be the end point for itself. We shouldn't necessarily see, well, I just, I'm doing music because I want to be better at maths or have a great, you know, better IQ. Do you find that when people, children or adults, are active in creating music in whatever way they want without, you know, formal rules or structure, do they seem to report create greater creativity in other aspects of their life? Do they? Does it seem to sort of be a portal to opening up a creative room in your head, I guess, in your brain? I think it, it actually opens up a way of thinking and engaging with the world. Um, one of the studies that I've un undertaken was in a juvenile justice setting where um, I was researching the, the establishment of a music program in one of those institutions. And it was a, basically a rock and songwriting, rock music and songwriting program. And what we found from that is that it became a very powerful vehicle for developing what are known as the 5C theory of positive youth development. So to explain it very simply, learning an instrument, the individual develops competence in something. And for some of these young people, they have not been judged competent at too much. So they develop a competence and that competence gives a feeling of confidence, the second C. So that builds that element for them. Being confident in themselves, they are able to connect with others more effectively and particularly in a musical ensemble, because it, that's inbuilt into it. You are connecting with others in that environment. That process sort of builds a positive perception of character and the capacity to care, care for yourself and care for others. So I think there are the, some very powerful ways in which that in, engagement with music can help us be human. There are examples of the value of play and creative pursuits everywhere we look. But as adults, we still struggle to take fun seriously, prioritising productivity over play time and again. Ironically, we're undermining ourselves. In last week's episode, we heard organisational psychologist Dr Mike Rucker, author of The Fun Habit, discuss the consequences of depriving ourselves of fun. Luckily, he has a prescription. You made that um, link between being fun deprived or fun starved and sleep deprived or sleep starved. Do you, in the same way that after you have a great sleep, you wake up feeling refreshed and reinvigorated, do you feel the same way after you do these playful things? Yes, absolutely. And there's science to back that up. For anyone that wants to geek out on the science, the principle here is called the hedonic flexibility principle. And uh, there's been a bunch of amazing studies in this area, but one that I really like it comes out of MIT, Stanford, and Harvard. They looked at 28,000 different participants. I believe they were in France, but they tracked people's behavior and what they did. And what they found, and this shouldn't be surprising, is the folks that were just grinding it out, right? Essentially working um, the entire day and not finding too much time for fun. Uh, 
you know, ultimately looked for when they had the time, poor ways to escape that discomfort. So things like, you know, mindlessly scrolling social media or perhaps things even worse, you know, drinking, things of that nature. But the folks that did have a true transition ritual and were taking time off the table for themselves were the ones that were showing up the next day um, with more vigor and vitality to attack the day, were more productive. And then also, as we already gave a nod to, were the ones that weren't only just more innovative, but also seeked out harder challenges because like your surgeon friend, they weren't so depleted that they were like, you know, all I want is a nice bed, right? They were the ones that were like, I've got, you know, some vitality, so let's go charge it. Let's go figure it out. For some folks that was, you know, figuring out what, you know, work challenge they wanted to tackle. For others, it was finding, you know, harder things um, outside of their work life. You know, so those are the folks that are climbing mountains or, you know, engaging in a spiritual practice, you know, and, and things of that nature. Children don't need much encouragement to play. Adults, on the other hand, frankly, sometimes even the idea of fun just doesn't sound very, well, fun. So what should we do if someone is listening to this and they're like, I can't remember the last time I did anything remotely playful. What's a nice, easy way that they can start that doesn't seem too um, overwhelming? Yeah, that's fair. I think, you know, there's a whole host of different sort of solutions for lack of a better word. And I think it will be based on your preferences. You know, for some folks, um, and I kind of unpack that in, in the book, The Fun Habit, you know, one of the problems when people say, oh, I'm just not fun, it's because especially, again, you know, I think this holds true in Oceania as much as it holds true in North America. We've been marketed that this, you know, ideal of fun are these high arousal, very extroverted activities, where if you look at, you know, kind of a general definition of fun, just being things that are pleasurable that you're attracted to, you know, instead of depleting and things that repel you then fun mm. can be curled up with a good book or it can be at a quiet mm. coffee shop with your best friend. So figuring out what those things are and making sure that they're scheduled is a really important first step, as simple as that sounds, right? And so in behavioral science, we call this pre-commitment. But if we actually put them on our schedule, like, you know what, I haven't had fun in a while, so I'm gonna call my fun friend and just make sure that we get something on the calendar. It can be that easy. There's also even simpler ways of just reframing your time, right? This work comes from Dr. Cassie Holmes out at UCLA here in the States, but she simply gave people the prime to go into their weekend thinking that it's a vacation. No other instructions or, you know, like prompts to do anything. Just remember that this is your time for renewal. And she found that that act of mindfulness enabled people to just make better choices because, oh, yeah. I don't need to like grind it out, you know, on a Saturday night to do this report. This is meant to be my time. And sure enough, when people came back, you know, Monday for work, they had the vigor and vitality to check, tackle that challenge. And study after study has shown that when people do create these transition barriers between work and leisure, that they're actually more productive. So paradoxically, they're getting more done. So those people that are worried mm -hmm. like, well, I just need to finish this and then everything will be okay. Again, that becomes insidious, right? Because there will always be the next thing. That's right. What do you do for fun, Mike? Hmm. I've really been trying to lean in to bonding with my kids. I feel like kids are amazing teachers, especially for adults that have kind of, you know, forgotten how to have fun. And so we're doing a lot of um, uh, classes. So I find that really enjoyable because instead of yeah. a parent trying to teach their child where like if something goes wrong, that it becomes this teachable moment. When I'm taking a <laughs> cooking class with my daughter, right? Like if we both mess up yeah. and we can laugh at each You're other. You're both rubbish. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and the teacher becomes the villain, right? So we bond yeah. because we're in this collective shared experience. There's not a power dynamic or an exchange of wisdom or, you know, any sort of, you know, uh, pr you know, architecture where, it, you know, it, it's not us enjoying something. And so that's been really fun for me. Adults, especially the perfectionists amongst us, can be a little nervous about being creative. Here's Margaret again. What advice would you give to an adult who feels almost frozen in creativity but does want to get back to that part of themselves? I'd say it begins in play. And I th think so much in music, we focus on the expert endpoint. Mm. And that is held up as the singular model 
of how to be with and in music. Mm. That you've got to stay shut up in a room by yourself until you're good enough yeah. to go out and be in that expert model. But there are so many music practices around the world where that is not the case. Mm. And like what? what? What does that look like? Oh, I'm thinking of the the Irish community sings in in the pub. Everybody's in there, yeah. and everybody takes a part to the level of their expertise. Huh. You know, so so you may have some who are who are taking the lead song. There are others who are taking the beat. There are others who are providing an accompaniment. It mm. may be a rhythmic accompaniment, but the important thing is. Everybody's a performer. Mm. There is no separation that says, oh, we're the performers, yeah. you're the audience. So you sit there and be quiet. Everyone's in there and it's accepted. So to go back to your question about how do you get started, first of all, cut yourself some slack. You don't have to be perfect. In fact, that's, that's not even the point. The point is to, to play with something, mm. to play with something that you love and, and to explore find some like-minded people. There are lots of community organizations. There are all sorts of, of choirs, community ensembles that you can join and take the risk of exposing yourself. There are opportunities to inject a little playfulness into our days all the time if you're paying attention. And Rob Walker, the author of The Art of Noticing and its associated newsletter, certainly is. Many of the activities that you recommend in your book are play-based and they're often games that we might remember from when we were in school. Are you, do, do readers find that challenging? I think readers are actually really super into it. So I, uh, a, as you know, in addition to the book, I have the newsletter that, uh, where I throw, I, I threw out and, and recently, and it just, I'm just bringing this up because I recently had an example where I was describing how well, I was at the airport and I was killing time and I, I didn't want to stand there looking at Instagram. So I made up a game of like, would I wear that t-shirt where I <laughs> just sort of looked at people walking by. <laughs> okay. So I, sh and you know, it's funny because then you say like, you know, a t-shirt that just says hubby. And it's like, <laughs> oh my God, who would wear that? Um, well, that guy. <laughs> and it's, it's fun, right? But people were really the, I bring it up because people were, you know, you ask about reader reactions. People were really responsive to it and they uh, shared with me their own games that they play in similar situations, which were things like, you know, make up well. So try to deduce the relationship between yeah. people, try to uh, guess the profession of yeah. someone, you know, yeah, uh, things like this. And then someone was like who they would sleep with. But, you know, <laughs> that's a little that's more of an adult game. Uh, but, you know, I think people are I think people are very receptive to it. Um, if you kind of give them permission and I think people, I mean, even if you just give them the permission to talk about it, cause I think even I can tell in the way you're reacting that like, these are familiar, like you, we do this, mm. but we feel a little sheepish about it or, but it's fun and it's, and it's in a way it's creative and it's, you know, people watching is actually a very imaginative and, uh, uh, creative, uh, endeavor. Can you um, tell us, uh, apart from uh, judging the T-shirts of those around us, how can we <laughs> integrate more attention-building play into our daily routines? Yeah, so this is something that comes up a lot. And what I've been thinking about lately, and this is another thing that sort of came from a, something that a, a reader wrote to me about how uh, she had gotten sick of walking her dog basically because the dog would take forever to sniff everything and it was just boring and it's the same neighborhood and blah, blah, blah. But, um, but she learned to back off and like really take those moments. These the most annoying moments. Here was the key to it is like, take the most annoying moment, the most drippy part of your day, the most dredgy thing and challenge yourself to like, what is the game that I can invent? that will lighten this, the worst thing. So it's a double game. So the first part of the game is what is the most boring, useless part of your day? <laughs> and it could be the dishes. It could be, you know, we've all got our drudge task. And so challenge yourself as you would as a child. I mean, I certainly did. And I remember I was thinking about because of this, I was thinking about how as a kid, I used to have to do 
like mowing the lawn and things like this. And I would narrate in my head, like as if a sportscaster, like as if I was in the Olympics of lawn mowing. <laughs> Walker's turning the corner is a great technique. So, <laughs> yeah. you know. We've never seen uh, grass cut so low. Yeah, I've never seen it. It's incredible. It's, it could be a world record. We could be, <laughs> this could be history, folks. <laughs> um, so it's a double game there. So that's my advice on that is identify the most ridiculously boring part of your day and figure out a game that could lighten it uh, 10%. What I love about what you're saying, Rob, is that so often mindfulness, um, it, it's described as a practice and that can be quite tedious. It's something you have to work on. But you seem to frame mindfulness and attention in a very playful and fun way. It, it doesn't have to be about two hours of silent Zen meditation, um, but it's actually quite creative and joyful. Yeah. And, um, I'm aware of this, but in a sort of indirect way. And I sort of back into, uh, mindfulness and meditation and ideas like that. I do think that what I'm advocating does overlap and maybe serve as like an entryway for people to, but I can't claim that that was my intent. I was, uh, got started on this more having to do with just winning the attention war and like fending off attacks on your so very more straightforward day-to-day -day thing kind of cross-matched with artistic creativity and where inspiration comes from because i strongly believe that noticing things that other people overlook is kind of the beginning of mm. creativity mm. and that kind of indirectly led to certain games of just you know sitting in silence for a certain amount of time and seeing counting how many things you can hear that turned out to really overlap like in the process of researching stuff like that i started to come up against or to come, come up to encounter mindfulness as a concept meditation as a practice and yeah i mean as an outsider it did seem to me that it seemed a little it sounded intimidating and i had i had i had experimented with meditation before and it, it just seemed like wow this is really hard mm. uh which it, I guess it is to do it well, but, but that's the wrong message to send. You, you want it to feel approachable mm. and I don't make any claims to this, but I hope that, that people who encounter the work that I'm doing, some of them, I, cause I do cite meditation and mindfulness work that it will lead in that direction for some people. Mm. Um, a gateway drug, I guess. Uh, I was going to say exactly the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> Rob, thank you so much for your time today. And I would definitely wear your shirt. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Whether you're singing off key in the car, goofing around in a fun new class, or simply telling yourself a silly story about the couple at the next table over, Embracing play just may be the secret ingredient to a little more balance in your life. Thank you for joining What Happens Next for our series on play. Thank you as well to all our guests on this series, Professor Margaret S. Barrett, Laureate Professor Marilyn Fleer, Dr. Xavier Ho, Dr. Mike Rucker and Rob Walker. Visit our show notes for a link to Rob's newsletter, more information about Mike's book and additional information about all our guests' fascinating work. We'll be back next week with an all new topic.